Chapter 190, Opium Wars. By the mid-90s, Afghanistan was the world's leading producer of opium and hashish, and the Afghan dope was considered to be the best on the market. But the Taliban had recently took control of the country and was destroying the millions of acres of opium fields. Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and other Muslim countries helped to finance the Taliban war on opium. But America and its Western allies were financing an opposition group called the Northern Alliance. They were formed in 1996 in response. Their goal was to defeat the Taliban so they could take control of the opium fields and place it back onto the world's market so the heroin addicts worldwide could get easy access. The American prison system and drug rehab businesses were raking in trillions of dollars from the heroin users and dealers. So it was a win-win, win-win. Profits from the heroin, win. Destroy poor communities, win. Enjoy watching them kill each other, win. And profit from them going to prison, win. The Taliban were deeply conservative and loyal to their interpretation of Islam, which refuted any drug trafficking or use. And in 2000, their leader, Mullah Omar, officially banned opium cultivation and trafficking. Armed Taliban fighters were using tractors to tear up acres upon acres of poppy plants that is used to make opium, which is used to make morphine, codeine, and heroin. This edict by Mr. Omar put in motion an all-out war against the Taliban. The Northern Alliance, with their European and American financing, who were also Afghans, were focused on profits and being loyal to their foreign governments, mercenaries, and warlords. In the beginning of the war, the Northern Alliance were able to take control of the northern part of Afghanistan, but the Taliban relentless fighters were able to beat them back, even with their superior weapons. Within a year, the Taliban had defeated the Northern Alliance and took full control of Afghanistan in the opium fields. The drug-addicted citizens of American Europe were starving for a high and the big business of drug treatment in prisons were losing money because of the lack of drug addicts to fill the classes in prison beds. Crack was a small fraction of what it was in the 80s and early 90s and not enough people used PCP and meth. Trillions of dollars were being lost on the world market because of the Chinese crackdown on dope and the Taliban's war on opium. So something drastic had to be done. Enter 9-11. America and Europe had to justify to their civilian population why an invasion of Afghanistan was necessary. And an invasion to take back control of the opium fields wouldn't work. The best way to get everybody on the same page is to use fear. The fear of violence. The fear of the loss of freedom. The loss of culture the loss of peace. One word was good enough to accomplish this goal. Terrorism. And terrorism needed a face, a boogeyman. Someone that would scare white Americans and Europeans. Someone white kids would have nightmares about. It used to be Fidel Castro, then Muammar Gaddafi, then Saddam Hussein. Kim Il-sung. But now it was a new one. A tall Saudi Arabian Muslim by the name of Osama bin Laden. America already hated Osama because he was wealthy and the leader of a revolution against European colonialism. He took his billions in wealth not to buy yachts and mansions, but to fight and finance a holy war against the heroin addict. He was bankrolling thousands of fighters to remove the white colonizers and occupiers from Arab land and then to ultimately destroy the poppy fields. This battle was the hardest battle of all on a planet loaded with money, junkies and heroin dealers. The Taliban basically declared war when they started destroying the heroin fields. And now the war was being taken to the next level. The Americans and the Europeans were preparing for an all-out war to get the Afghan heroin back onto the streets of their countries and back onto the world market. But they weren't planning on going to war with Saudi Arabia. 
where Bin Laden and majority of the supposed 9-11 hijackers were from. Nope. They were planning on going to war with Afghanistan, the country with the best opium. On October 7th, the invasion began. Good afternoon. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. We are joined in this operation by our staunch friend, Great Britain. Other close friends, including Canada, Australia, Germany, and France have pledged forces as the operation unfolds. The same day, I was released from the halfway house. I was 29 years old. Chapter 191, Catch Up. I saved most of the money that a few homies dropped off to me at the halfway house and used it to get an apartment. I had the car one of my homies purchased, so I was good. I had a foundation, some wheels, and a roof. I still had 11 years of parole to serve, but at least I was free. I was physically free, but I was still psychologically incarcerated. Plus, I was bitter. I felt I had lost close to seven years of my life unjustly. I felt I was unfairly treated by the injustice system. If one creates the law for ones to follow, then the creator of the law must do the same. If my rights were so easily violated, then the idea of every individual having rights was a farce. An illusion. It came with stipulations. But here I was, 29 years old, with all of my 20s spent in prison. I felt old. I felt angry. I felt behind, and I felt that I needed to catch up. Which is a major mistake. I didn't even think about following any laws with my release. Every law was broken to keep me in prison, so following the law for me was like a fish on land. It was like oil and water. Religion and reason, it didn't mix, it wasn't in season. I still had all my connects and they were all waiting for my call. I still had the Colombians on speed dial. The dreads waiting for the chirps from my next tail. I still had the outlets to move any product and they were waiting for me to make a move. It was simple math. Pick it up from one person, Mark up the price, give it to another, and keep the profits. The foundation of hustling isn't rocket science, but the complications that comes with hustling is. The streets was like a child, changed by the minute. Stay away for a few years, it becomes unrecognizable. The composition changes by the day. What you thought you knew was only a snippet. Just one week away and you don't know who is snitching. The guy that was a certified gangster last month could be an informant today. If one wasn't aware, he may get caught up in his web. The guy that was a pussy last month may be the biggest stick-up boy now. Robbing everything moving and leaving victims everywhere. If one wasn't aware, he may overlook the youngin. Same youngin put you to bed. I was gone for over six years. It was suicidal for me to aim in the outlaw direction immediately. I fully understood RICO, CCE conspiracy, and kingpin laws. I knew you only needed to employ four people to be considered a kingpin. And kingpin charges carried life. Didn't matter how much money was made. I also fully understood that once I got back into the drug game, guns, robbery, and murder came with it. I knew guns were as important as my eyesight. But I also knew the feds were giving men 10 to 15 years for a gun charge. I knew men that were sentenced for slugs. One year for each bullet. A whole clip was 11. Caught with an extendo, he was finished. I knew men that were never coming home on a pistol charge. Third strike and sentenced to life. 
all appeals lost. This game was for Mad Men, yet I still set my sights on it. I needed to catch up. The five and a half years I served, followed immediately by another six and a half years, pushed me too far behind. That's 12 years in the rear view. I needed them 12 years back. I also knew that I was under the Fed's microscope. It was common sense that I would be. I was back in society after navigating and escaping a tornado, a tsunami, and a hurricane all at once. I escaped the Kennedy Street RICO conspiracy by a threat, even after the killings of FBI agents and homicide detectives. I had murder charges dismissed. I made it through the federal prison system with only disciplinary reports. I made it through the notorious Lawton without a scratch and ducked potential attempted murder charges by a hair. I slipped escapes and assaulting officers cases. I made it through the notorious private prison Youngstown, Ohio with only wins, escaping multiple assault charges. I made it through the notorious South One Supermax at DC jail with only hunger pains. I made it through the notorious Sussex One with only anger even after Ty tried to kill a captain and me being blamed for it. I made it through the notorious Sussex 2 with a peaceful mind. I made it through the ultra notorious Red Onion with only a damaged eardrum. Damage from the shotgun sounds and the loud screams from the rednecks. I made parole. And now I was gonna make it in society. I understood that anytime we played catch up, we fell behind. Yet I still felt the need to catch up because I felt behind. I needed to get back something that I couldn't get back. The years that I lost. I wanted to get back on the ones that took those years. I was lost. I wanted revenge. But revenge on who? I wanted to kill every rat in Washington. I wanted to make examples. I needed some redemption. I wanted heads on my mantle.